This is a part of a symposia that looks at, I could say, freedom from a very broad perspective. So although you're hearing today about a particular um, discussion on justice and innocence, I think the common theme here is one has to struggle, one has to be vigilant, and one has to engage in dialogue. And it is really humbling to see this kind of fora to see these kinds of people who do the research and says, no, if you're innocent, you're innocent. You shouldn't confess to something you didn't do just to avoid something greater being held over your head. Let me stop there and then introduce our moderator, who is uh, Rebecca Brown. Um, she currently serves as the Director of State Policy Reform at the Innocence Project, an organization based out of the Benjamin Carzuda School of Law at Yeshiva. And it is dedicated to exonerating uh, <clears throat> wrongfully convicted uh, individuals. Today, she joins us to discuss with Saul Kassin how New York can reform its criminal justice system to prevent false confessions and reduce wrongful convictions. Ms. Brown. Thank you. Hello. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here at John Jay today and to uh, moderate a discussion with one of my personal heroes, Dr. Saul Kassin. Uh, who's a distinguished professor of psychology here at John Jay. Uh, policymakers and lawmakers are typically confounded by the phenomenon of false confessions, and, and I find myself eternally grateful for the work of Dr. Kasson, who pioneered the scientific study of false confessions by introducing a three-part taxonomy that's universally accepted and research paradigms that are widely used to examine how people are targeted for interrogation, why they waive their rights, why they confess, and the corruptive effects of that evidence on other forms of evidence. He's published numerous scientific articles and book chapters on this subject and was awarded an APA presidential citation for his research on false confessions. His work is cited all over the world and is currently funded by the National Science Foundation. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Kasson. It's a pleasure to give this talk, and you know I should warn you up front. Uh, when I talk about confessions and why innocent people confess, I have found over the course of the years that people have a tough time understanding the concept because the first your mind goes to the question: Would I ever confess to something I didn't do, short of having a gun to my head? And the answer is no. Uh, I have found that people have an easier time understanding suicide. We understand why someone would kill themselves. Before we, under, before we understand why someone would confess to something they didn't do. Uh, Rebecca talked about the Central Park Five. I want to give a shameless plug in opening this talk to that film. The Central Park Jogger case is, as I said, it has great symbolic and historic value, and in some ways it is remarkable that there are five false confessions taken out of a single investigation right smack in the middle of Manhattan. But I should also tell you that it's also mundane. And as spectacular as this case seems, it is not one of a kind. It is not unique. There are others like it, and they happen all the time. And so I want to say a little bit about this case, because it's only one of the DNA exoneration cases, in fact, that you can find if you log into the Innocence Project website. When you look at this database, what nobody saw coming is that what is now 30% of these Innocence Project wrongful convictions had confessions in evidence. Now, you have to back up a bit to understand that in the legal system, confession has always been regarded the gold standard in evidence. When you had a confession, according to most legal scholars, you had, and they were correct, the functional equivalent of a conviction. It is also important to realize because 30% of 305 cases may sound to you like, wow, that's the sum total of false confessions out there in the world? Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. That is the tip of a very large iceberg. What is not included are these people and the thousands they represent. So, for example, I don't know if any of you recognize the guy up in the top left-hand corner. Exactly. John Mark Carr who voluntarily, for the most part, for three years, was confessing to the murder of John Benet Ramsey. 
He ultimately confessed again, was arrested, but then the DA, uh, DA's office in Boulder, Colorado never filed charges because it turns out the physical evidence showed it wasn't him. I don't know whether he believed he was involved, whether he was just trying to get attention, whether he was delusional, but John Mark Carr is one of those cases that won't show up in the Innocence Project database. And there's one other I want to talk about. Joaquin Robles, he's next to her. These cases don't just come out of the criminal justice system. They come out of the military system, where POWs are often propped up to give confessions to war crimes or espionage or something else that they didn't do. And it happens in the corporate world. Joaquin Robles was an, uh, an employee of AutoZone in San Diego. Uh, $837 turned up missing. He was identified by the loss prevention manager at this AutoZone branch as an employee who had the possibility and potential of doing this. He was brought into a back room and interrogated, much the way criminals are interrogated in the system. And in the end, he signed a confession saying, I'm sorry, I needed the money, I'm not, I don't have a drug habit, I don't have a, a gambling habit, but my family did have credit card debt and I thought that this opportunity presented a way to clear that. The money was then found. He then turned around and sued AutoZone. I was the expert on his behalf in this case, and won a very large award. In, in the light of that award, my phone rang off the hook, and it rang off the hook from employees of Walmart, Kmart, Target, 7-Eleven, you name it, they're out there. When you asked him, well, why did you do that? He said, they said they were gonna take it to the police or we could keep it in house. I figured it was worth $837 to keep my job. Pretty rational decision. That's the nature of a false confession. Ultimately, they are often a rational decision. We know that this is a phenomenon that goes way back. It sounds new. It sounds like a post-DNA phenomenon. It's not. You know, read your American history, prior to American history. The Salem witch trials of the 1690s feature all sorts of false confessions taken largely from women. While I cannot attach a prevalence rate to false confessions, I can tell you that they come in three piles. When I first started to investigate this problem in, in the early 1980s, it was clear to me, going back over the pages of legal history, that when you look at cases of known proven false confessions, they kind of naturally sort themselves into three piles. There were the voluntary cases, which happened most classically in the case in 1932 when Charles Lindbergh's baby uh, boy was kidnapped, and 200 plus people volunteered confessions. Uh, it is my sense that these voluntary false confessions don't typically present a problem for the system because it is interesting to me that when somebody walks into a police station and volunteers a confession, the impulsive response is to be met with skepticism. And the police will often say, okay, you tell us you committed this murder, tell me about it, tell me what you know, tell me about what the victim was wearing, what the crime scene looked like, and that's obviously where the, the voluntary false confessor fails the test. The other two types of false confession come about as a result of police interrogation. And I, I, without getting into a whole lot of detail, the compliant type of false confession is the easiest to understand. This is the type you can imagine yourself. Just, just say to yourself, I have a breaking point. Everybody has a breaking point. These are cases where innocent people who know they're innocent confess anyway because they just got to get out of the situation. They can't take it anymore. But then there's the third type. Now, in 1985, when we identified this type, even we didn't really understand what we were looking at. There was not, at the time, a psychology in the cognitive literature on false memories. We now know how exactly this happened. But there were cases, and a fair number of them, and you still see them today, where not only does the innocent person confess, agree to sign a confession, but the innocent person starts to think he did it. They often even confabulate memories to support that false belief. So these are a whole different type of case, and these are the ones that are the most, I think, the most vexing for everybody in the system. Um, in every case, I think it's important to ask three questions. First of all, so why was this innocent confessor, why was this innocent person interrogated in the first place? The police don't just interrogate anybody, they interrogate people they call suspects. So why was an innocent person a suspect to begin with? Two, what then happens when that suspect is hauled into an interrogation room that makes that innocent person confess? 
And why do confessions trump innocence? Why is it that when an innocent person confesses and go to trial, judge, the jury, the prosecutor, the public believes they are guilty? There are reasons for this. This isn't, this isn't a story about people being stupid. This is a story about chains of events, chains of events that begin with that confession. Let me start talking about that first question and the pre-interview. I had mentioned that police don't just interrogate anybody. It's important to make a distinction between two processes, the process of interviewing and the process of interrogation. Now, those terms are often used synonymously, but in fact, the, the, the techniques of interrogation that, uh, that US uh, and, and, and elsewhere in the world police are trained to use make a very explicit distinction. First, we have to identify the suspect. And we don't do that by hurling accusations. That's done through an information gathering interview. We ask the suspect a series of questions. We think these questions are diagnostic of whether the person is lying or telling the truth. And we observe carefully that person's behavior. Why? Because the purpose of a pre-interrogation interview is to determine if this person we're talking to is the criminal and a liar when he declares his innocence or an innocent person. Truth and lie deception is the goal of the pre-interrogation interview. The claim is that these, uh, these, claims, uh, that, that these judgments can be made at 85 to 90% levels of accuracy. Um, it's not true. It's just not true. The number one cue sampled and surveyed across 60 different cultures, everybody comes up with exactly the same number one cue, is eye contact. As soon as somebody can't give me eye contact, or as officers often say, he broke eye contact, I, I knew he was lying to me. Well, that's a common sense notion. In fact, it's what the training model of the re-technique uses. It's one of those cues, one of those nonverbal cues that they train their interrogators to use. Why? Because our intuitive theory tells us, and our intuitive theories have told us this since the start of world history, that the way you know if someone is lying is if they show anxiety. Because lying provokes anxiety. And the anxiety then leaks out of the body. They can't look you in the eye. They start fidgeting. They start looking away. They turn away. Those are the cues that investigators are trained to use. Uh, the empirical correlation, when I say the empirical correlation, I mean researchers bring people into the lab, they do controlled studies, they have them tell known truths or known lies, they videotape them while they're telling these statements, and then you look back and you analyze and code their behaviors, and you look to see whether the behavior is correlated with truth-telling and lying. The correlation, I can say it in a very simple way, the correlation between eye contact and deception is zero. A good liar will look you right in the eye and deliver. And then there are some people who, when they're put under pressure, become socially anxious and show their anxiety by looking away. It doesn't make them, doesn't make them criminals, it just makes them anxious. Now, why this becomes a problem is because investigators are trained to believe they can do this. So they make a judgment. Often the judgment is a deception judgment. And that results in an innocent person being interrogated. And so when that judgment is made at the start, and, that person, and, and, and an investigator decides to move on to interrogation, that judgment is made by an interrogator who can't really make that judgment based on these cues. Now, if there's other evidence Word on the street, witnesses, informants, that's different. It's amazing, though, how the routine, typical confession case, bad confession case, there is nothing else, which is precisely why they're hurtling into the interrogation room. Now, what happens when they get there? One, it's essential that they isolate a suspect before questioning. Uh, you will never see a, a false confession taken in someone's living room. Uh, the false confession is taken in a police station in a back room that is often soundproof, it's often small, barely furnished, if at all. Uh, it is not a pleasant place for the suspect to be. They, they don't hear family members who may be at the police station, phones ringing. And so they're out of sorts. They are to be isolated and, and, and essentially not in a particularly comfortable state of mind. Why? Because they want out. And that is the incentive for a false confession, is I got to get out of this bad situation. The processes come down to this. P 
police first will make confrontational statements. They will, the opening salvo of an American-styled interrogation is an accusation. It's a process that already takes place once an investigator decides that this suspect is our criminal. I know you did it, and I don't want to hear any lies. And that is why interrogation seems to many a very relentless process. And this is why there is no turning back once that judgment has been made. To me, the most disturbing weapons legally, lawfully available to the American interrogator, not to European interrogators in most countries, is the lie about evidence. It is lawful for police interrogators to lie about the evidence. You say you weren't involved, then how do you explain the fact that we have your fingerprints on the knife? Or how do you explain the fact that you failed this polygraph when, in fact, you didn't fail it? That is part of the confrontational process designed to break the suspect down into a state of despair. So you have a suspect who wants out, and it's clear that denial isn't the way out. The third set of processes intertwined in all of this, I have kind of loosely called them all minimization. This now is the interrogator who is also friendly and sympathetic and understanding and makes minimizing remarks that minimize the moral seriousness or provide moral justification for this crime. So for example, it might, uh, the, the interrogator might say to the suspect, look, I think you're a good person and I think you just got caught up in something. What minimization does, I've done these studies, is when people hear minimizing remarks, their expectation is, oh, it's not really a big deal and therefore confession will not result in the worst possible consequence. And for a suspect who feels trapped, that becomes a way out. Then, the, then there are certain interrogation aspects, uh, uh, conditions and, and tactics that I think put people, even normal people, even not so vulnerable people at risk. One, very clear, is time. Time is a very interesting metric. The average interrogation in the country lasts 30 minutes to an hour. An hour to two hours, if you want to encompass a larger number, go up to more serious cases, it can go up to four hours. Even Reed and Associates say you shouldn't have to exceed four hours. When you look at false confession, known false confession cases where time records were kept, the average was 16.3 hours. It's not hard to understand that people become fatigued and that when they become fatigued, they become more likely to do something that is natural to human nature, which is to sacrifice the future for the present and to basically make a short-term decision, I got to get out of here and I, I want this to stop and the rest will work itself out. These stories are not about weak and vulnerable individuals necessarily and they're not about highly aggressive police interrogation tactics necessarily. Uh, they're also about this funny state of mind that I have started to lock into uh, over the last eight or so years, and it's innocence. Imagine yourself innocent. The police bring you in, you've done nothing wrong. Not only do you have done nothing wrong, you don't know anything about what they're asking. You've done nothing wrong, but now you've been identified a liar, and now you're being accused in interrogation, and you want out. What is the one thing you can do to stop this process from getting you into trouble? And the answer is simple. We have our right to silence. We have the right to a lawyer. We have our Miranda rights. We can each recite it now, chapter and verse, probably without being warned. We know those rights. Well, first of all, innocent people, vast majorities of innocent people, waive their rights. And when you ask them afterward, well, why did you do that? They give you this blank look. Well, I don't know. I didn't need a lawyer. I didn't do anything wrong. The innocent person has nothing to fear. When I talk about lying about evidence to police, very often investigators will make a distinction and they will make a good distinction. And they will say, I don't really lie, I bluff. What is the bluff? The bluff means I tell them we have evidence. I didn't say it's evidence against you. I say we collected hairs, we sent them to the lab. To the innocent person, that bluff, that threat of future evidence is actually a promise of future exoneration which paradoxically makes it easier to confess. We have found this now in the lab. For an innocent person, that's the ticket to freedom. So they hear that there is this evidence they're gonna send off to the lab, and they think, great, I'm gonna sign now, and when the evidence comes back, they'll see I didn't do it. 
That's the mind of an innocent person. When I looked at Innocence Project cases, I thought, you know, if confession has the power to corrupt other evidence, then we should be able to find that most confession cases in the, in the, in the Innocence Project website are not just based, the errors are not just confessions. And sure enough, the vast majority of them are not. Most of those cases are not based solely on a confession. They're based on a confession and a snitch, or a confession and a witness, or a confession and bad forensic science. And guess what? Two-thirds of the time, the confession came first, and the others followed. And the point is this. Once there's a confession out in the air, even if that confession is flawed, it will contain metrics of its own corroboration because it contains details, guilty knowledge, and it will contain, uh, in likelihood, other evidence that came about as a result. Barry Lofman was uh, convicted in 1988 of murdering his elderly neighbor. Uh, he was convicted on the basis of confession. 2004, he was exonerated. But here's what happened. Lofman gave a confession. As a result of the confession, because the police knew at the time he had already given that, before he was even questioned, they knew that the rapist, in this case, because there was a rape and a murder, was a type A secretor blood type. They immediately, upon getting Lofman's confession, they drew his blood. Uh-oh, he turned out to be a type B. Didn't match the rapist. The forensic scientist in this case, the state forensic chemist, concocted four theories, none of them grounded in science, to explain away the mismatch. And that's what happened to that evidence that should have been inconsistent. Then, an article appeared in a paper reporting about this confession, and this woman was killed on a certain night. Two witnesses came to police and said, well, you know, the confession says he killed her on a certain night, but we talked to her in her garden the next day. And the police sent them home, and this is a quote out of the case file, you must have seen a ghost. That's what happens when there's a confession in the air. It changes and corrupts other evidence. The last thing I want to say, prospects for reform. Uh, I'm going to say very little because I know that Rebecca, this is where the Innocence Project policy director becomes an important person. Um, the most important by far, the most important uh, uh, reform in this area is a full videotaping requirement. It should simply be the case that interrogations be fully and entirely recorded. Uh, when I first came into, uh, into, into recognition about the possibilities, it was in the 1980s, when what you would see is a lot of DAs around the country, starting actually in New York, uh, had the practice of interrogating suspects off camera, and then when the suspects were ready to give a statement, they turned on the camera. And so all the judge and the jury got to see was the final statement, not the hours of the process that preceded it. I think, in a variety of ways, for a variety of reasons, you will get better justice uh, and less mistakes and a better safety net from judges and juries and prosecutors uh, if you video record all of these statements. And uh, there is other stuff, but I'm going to stop it right there. Thank you. Well, I was struck by so much that, that you said. Um, you know, uh, in terms of recording of interrogations, about 20 states now record custodial interrogations. Um, and those laws are really, they really vary in substance and scope. For instance, some, like Illinois, they only require that uh, interrogations be recorded if it's a homicide investigation, whereas others include all violent felonies. Um, but, you know, one thing that I've noticed in terms of, you know, how different states treat uh, when they turn on the tape is, is kind of a big issue, right? Do you do it once somebody is advised of their Miranda rights? Do you do it when a person reasonably believes himself to be in custody? I like the way they do it in D.C. The D.C. Metro Police have a system where as soon as they bring, all questioning is to take place in-house, and as soon as they bring their suspect into questioning, they wait till there's an open room, an interrogation room, they bring them in, and when they walk into the room, two things happen. The lights flick on, and the camera flicks on. So custody is the trigger, right? right. And it should be custody, not whether this is an interview or, a, or, a, or an interrogation. Another thing that struck me that you were talking about was sort of how false confession evidence can corrupt other types of evidence. And it really struck me because, you know, in a post-conviction setting, when we want to prove the innocence of our clients, 
we have to rely on state statutes. Um, and those statutes also vary in substance and scope. And another thing I was really struck by when you talk about sort of the corrupting effect of a confession on other forms of evidence is uh, this idea that many statutes, when they're deciding whether or not someone can seek post-conviction DNA testing, say, we want to look at all of the evidence together. There's really no attention in the system to this problem. Um, you know, on appeal, one of, the, one of the frustrations I know that you see at the Innocence Project is often a judge goes back over, uh, an appeals court goes back over a confession and says, wow, that was a coerced confession. The judge made an error in allowing the jury to hear that. But looking at the other evidence, there's so much else as a basis for conviction that, yes, there was an error, but we believe it is harmless, so we're not overturning the conviction. Harmless because he would have been convicted on the basis of the other evidence. Harmless error is an interesting concept, but make no mistake about it. It is premised on an assumption, and the assumption it's premised on is that all of that evidence is independent of one another, right. when in fact it's all been right. conditioned by the confession. Right. So this mountain of evidence is really a house of cards built on a bad confession. Right. And you know, this blind phenomenon, which we really want to apply to other forms of evidence, we meet a lot of resistance um, when we want to for instance, when we want to do a lineup properly, we want the person conducting the lineup, administering the lineup, not know who the suspect is. Um, and we meet with incredible resistance to that, often because of a perception by law enforcement that we're attacking their integrity, as opposed to just taking the human factor out of this. It's really more about methods than people. But I'd love to open this up for questions from the audience. As my former federal law enforcement agency did not tell the individuals that they're being taped, and policymakers of that agency state that the confessions are more easier done when they do not know that the camera is present. What former agency would this be? No. We'll leave that one alone. <laughs> um, it's not. But it is federal. It's a federal. Yeah, one sure. It, and it's not a secret because a lot of the federal agencies have been trained in the read model, and the read technique folks have been up until this final edition of their book, the fifth edition, 2013 edition, vigorous, vociferous opponents of taping. And their rationale, primary rationale was, we don't think judges and juries will fully understand what we do, i.e., we don't think they would approve of what we do. Um, the problem with that argument is they should know what you do anyway because you're testifying as to what you did in court. So. Presumably, you're telling them what you actually said and did to the extent that you're saying it accurately. What's the difference if they see it or just get it secondhand? I would argue it's a big difference. The big difference is how can you go back and recreate a conversation hours long? Memory doesn't work that way. Why not give them the actual and, and not the, the actual conversation and not have them rely on your memory? I'm currently supervising a doctoral student who's a Chinese police officer and uh, doing her dissertation on interrogation. And the big thing where we have at most disagreements is where I might insist on a right to silence. She insists on a duty to tell the truth. And that for her is the central, the central claim and what drives the effort to make sure that you get a confession. The problem is defined to tell the truth. If you are an American-based interrogator and you have already decided that the suspect is your criminal, then the truth is a confession. And nothing short of the confession is the truth. And that's the problem. You know, that, that statement that has cemented itself in my head, because I've heard it so many times now, I don't interrogate innocent people, means that nothing short of a confession is the truth. And we don't stop till we get there. I uh, want to thank both of our um, presenters for a truly thought-provoking uh, discussion. Miranda was 34, what, almost 50 years ago, and the struggle continues. So do what you do, be morally upright, and thank you for coming.